Hello and welcome everyone. We're going to wait one minute just while people enter from the waiting room and then we'll dive right in. All right. I think we're, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Hello, everyone. My name is Ellen Mueller. I'm the director of the MFA program here at Minneapolis College of Art and Design. It's great to have you with us tonight. I'd like to start out um, with a land acknowledgement um, to introduce this event. I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that the land we are occupying in Minneapolis is unceded territory, the ancestral homelands of the Dakota people. Gathering here, we pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, and we acknowledge the grave harm that colonialism has brought to these lands, in particular, the erasure of both indigenous and African identities, not only under slavery, but under racist laws that have segregated all people. We honor all that who have lived here and um, do live here now at the intersections of identity and experience. So we want to welcome, welcome you all today and let you know that your audio and video are turned off um, for this webinar. And if you experience any technical difficulties, feel free to reach out at this email address and we'll try to help you out as quickly as possible. Um, please feel free to leave questions in the Q&A area and uh, we'll, we'll uh, review those as we go along. And a recording of this webinar will be made available after the event. And uh, we have a listing of full professional practices um, series at this link if you're interested. Um, also, I'd love to acknowledge and thank the wonderful people who make this series possible. Um, from our visiting faculty to our support staff, we couldn't do this without them. And this event is sponsored by the MCAT MFA program. We're a community of makers, thinkers, researchers, and creative professionals uh, working in a mentor-based interdisciplinary program. You can learn more at our website listed on screen. So today, it is my pleasure to introduce Gerald Ronning, who has taught at J uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, the University of Colorado Boulder, Naropa University, Albright College, and the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. He's also coordinated the Roadside Historical Marker Program for the Colorado Histor Historical Society. His scholarship has won prizes from the Center for American West and the Labor and the Labor and Working Class History Association, and he is the 2013 recipient of the Christian R. and Mary F. Lindback Distinguished Teaching Award. In 2017, he was awarded a Minnesota Historical and Cultural Heritage Grant. His current research is in U.S. labor and cultural history, and he has recently published a co-authored article in the Fretboard Journal. So without any further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand this over to Gerald Ronning. Thanks. Thank you so much. I, I don't know if you had to go all the way back to John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Um, <laughs> that was the 90s. Um, but it was a fun job. Um, but thanks to everyone who's, who's come to listen to me talk um, about uh, raising engagement um, by lowering the stakes. And uh, hopefully we can have some um, questions or conversation at the end. And I'll pause every once in a while and look at the chat um, to see if something um, of, of imminent or immediate importance pops up. Um, and I may stop and talk about that then. Um, we'll see. Um, I was just telling Ellen that this format seems to lend itself to a kind of a casual conversational style that I kind of like um, in some ways. So I, I, I didn't write out something to read. I do have some notes, so I'll glance down occasionally so I don't lose track um, or go off into a cul-de-sac and waste your time. Um, but, but really what I want to talk about today is kind of the holy grail of higher education, um, at least for the last five or six years, I've been having conversations about engagement and how do you get students to engage um, with one subject. And a lot of what I'm going to have to say um, this evening, um, and again, thanks for coming to an evening session, is, is kind of specific to, to kind of the interesting, sometimes vexing, sometimes infuriating task of teaching the liberal arts at a professional college of art and design. Um, which is a dramatically different experience than I had when I taught at a liberal arts college um, or a university uh, or Naropa University um, or John Jay. And, and I think there is a, a problem or a challenge. I guess I'll characterize it as a challenge and not a problem that 
that seems to not be correcting itself. I'm not going to say it's a crisis, um, but but there does seem to me to be lower student engagement. Um, obviously, right now we're in, in a co the COVID-19 pandemic, and that has its own complications, right? And I think we're all kind of experiencing um, sometimes serendipitously engaged students, but but also students who are turned off because you can't see them and they're they're behind their icons or their initials or um, you know you're just not sure they're checked in. Um, low student engagement to me, even before the COVID pandemic, kind of manifested itself in really unsatisfying discussions or, or no discussions whatsoever. Um, marked by a lack of participation, um, one or two students continually leading discussion and, and not a lot of crosstalk between students, right? Um, it seemed like the channels of communications are a hub and spoke model where the, the faculty is the hub and the spokes are all talking to you, but they're not communicating with one another. Um, there's kind of an epidemic of of late work um, being handed in or no work being handed in by students, which I think, um, you know, obviously um, is the evidence of a lack of engagement. Um, there's poor work where, where students seem to have little care for the quality um, of the, the product. It's about getting it done. Um, students who seem uncurious or incurious about their subject to me. Um, I mean, what I find most troubling about a lack of student engagement, and, and again, I don't want to characterize this as a problem worse than it is or a crisis. There are always students who are doing well and are engaged. But, but I wonder if they are leaving my class with the ability to teach themselves. And that's really kind of my goal. And that, to me, is, is, is really the goal of engagement, is, is that they, they are invested um, maybe not in your subject, but certainly in your method, and they leave that room able to find out more if they want to, um, to find out good information if they want to, to be able to discern um, what is good information and, and what is bad information. Now, I'm, I'm not sure what the sources of this challenge or this lack of engagement are. I haven't done any studies. I certainly do a lot of reading about it. I, I didn't face this issue of widespread lack of engagement um, at the previous traditional liberal arts college I taught at in central Pennsylvania, um, Albright College in Reading, Pennsylvania. And, and I had much bigger class sizes there, um, which seems kind of counterintuitive. Um, the typical 100 to 300 level class, I think we use 1,000 to, to three or 4,000 at MCAT, um, had easily 35 students um, and they were packed. Um, and I would have more people talking, um, not, and, and it was proportionally more. It wasn't just because it's not like the, the COVID testing argument. Right? It's not because there are more students that I have more people talking. I, I had a larger percentage of students talking. Um, these students were, you know, perhaps GPA driven. They're certainly more GPA driven than MCAT students. Um, uh, teaching at, at, at MCAT, I have discovered, I discovered very early on that, that that the grade point average is not an effective cudgel um, as it might be at, at a typical liberal arts college. They, they're they not worried about the grades, right? And so we can't rely upon that. Um, and that may be a source. Um, at typical liberal arts colleges, of course, you have people who major in your liberal arts discipline, which is certainly not the case at MCAD. Um, the liberal arts um, are a service department at MCAD. And I, I say that with no, um, uh, it's, it's not meant to be pejorative. I think it just is what it is, and that's fine. Um, we do have minors, so I think I think that in some of the classes, um, creative writing among them, narrative and storytelling, and some of the art history classes, this engagement issue is not as important, um, or is not as it doesn't present itself as much of a challenge because students have selected to be in there, and and they're being taught their interests, and they can see direct kind of. Uh, relationships between that class and their artistic practice, right? Um, comic students value narrative and storytelling. Um, you know, uh, art history, I think, is inherent value for artists. Um, you know, where I taught before, an engagement didn't seem to be a, 
and as much of an issue, obviously, the, the students did not come to a liberal arts college for arts. Some did. I'm not going to say that, that there were no artists there and there were art majors, um, but they came there for other things. So, so the, the humanities classes might have been more kind of intrinsically interesting to them. I think also at the traditional liberal arts colleges, most students don't know what the hell they're going to do when they leave. Um, and they may figure that out sometime between year one and year four. But because they don't know what they're going to do, I think they tried or tended to try to be adequate at all things, right? Um, they didn't kind of, you know, save their energy for their studio class and let the other ones slide uh, because they didn't yet know which ones were going to be valuable and which ones were not going to be valuable um, or what faculty recommendations are going to be important and which one's not going to be. And these are all kind of instrumental reasons why one would be engaged. But, but I mean, it, it seemed to help. Um, there was also less of a need to defend the kind of general education requirements at a liberal arts college. Um, what good is this, right? What use is this? How is this going to help me out? Um, this has nothing to do with what I want to do. And, and that those conversations came up far less frequently um, at other kinds of college. And, and, college. and those, those, those conversations do happen relatively frequently um, at MCAT. Um, you know, and, and, and I was not, you know, as a graduate student, I don't think I was trained for the engagement issue. It, it just, I took it for granted that students would be engaged. You know, my, my training in how to grade when I got into the PhD program at the University of Colorado Boulder, my first, the first professor that, that I worked for as a grader and a teaching assistant handed me a stack of 300 blue books and said, I want an 83 average. That was it, right? That was the, that was the end of the training. Um, and that kind of replicated itself across all of the classes I worked for. And so, and so what we called rigor, right, um, and, and that's something worth unpacking, and perhaps we can do that later on, um, really was setting this kind of artificial bar over which some people would, would be able to leap and other people would get, you know, get clocked, right, They'd get clotheslined. And, and so, you know, that's not going to fly either, um, not now. I don't know if, if that's going to fly in any college or university now, um, but certainly not NCAD. Um, so I'm going to get a little policy wonky here for a second, um, and it, this may not seem um, relevant to the, the conversation about rigor, um, but I think it is. So let me share this and make sure it's the correct one. Um, and play from start. So you're all looking at liberal arts college deliverables, correct, on your screen? Yep, that's what we've got. Okay, terrific. Um, and so, so this first slide um, uh, really is, is, is kind of a, a breakdown of what I ask students to do, right? Um, and these I would call the stakes, right? Um, these are the gradable moments, the deliverables, the stuff they got to do in order to get a grade. And so, so what I have up here on the first slide is, is what I did up until the time I got to MCAT. What was the typical kind of breakdown of what I would ask students to do? Um, and, and, and there was no real discernible lack of engagement. Now, had I tried a different path, I may have seen wildly more engagement. But, but since I didn't see engagement as an issue, right, this seemed to be okay. Um, and this is kind of where I landed after 11 years of teaching at Albright College. This is kind of was my basic kind of class, right? Um, so on the left, you'll see the kinds of deliverables I would ask for a topical class, right? Um, a history in you know, African American history or American foreign policy or US urban history, right? Um, it would be not necessarily the intro survey, the 100 level, but something at the 200 or 300 level. And, and typically I ask students to hand in three, four to six page analysis papers, specific topics, sometimes devoted to a monograph or a series of readings. Um, these would be 15 points each. They were spread over the semester, um, first, third, second, third. You know, I might hand out four assignments of which they would choose three, and that was my typical MO, so people would have a, a bad week and maybe not do something. These were graded papers, right? Um, I would go in there, do line by line grading. I would point out their use of passive voice. I would point out faulty arguments, thesis. 
I mean, this was a lot of grading on my part. And so this was a very high stakes assignment, each one of these three. Um, and 15 points out of 100 total for the class is not insignificant, right? Um, they would also typically have a midterm exam. Again, 20 points graded. A final exam, 25 points graded. And then a participation grade. This would be 10 points, and this would be graded more or less. And when I say EPF here, that's excellent, all 10 points. Passing, right, six, seven, eight, or nine points, depending on how committed they were, or failing. Um, and point reductions would come from absences. So there's not a lot of low stake stuff going on in, in, in my typical topical US history class or humanities class. And this was typical of, of many other people in my department and across the humanities and social sciences at the college. The research seminar would be <clears throat> four majors, majors in history. Um, and by the time I left the college, this is, was pretty much the breakdown. Um, students would have to lead a discussion that would be one tenth of their, their, their grade and it would be a graded exercise, right? Um, participation would be excellent passing or failing, um, 20 points. Um, so it's a little more for the research seminar, which gives people a little bit of cushion. So it's a little lower stakes, right? To encourage conversation and participation. But the real meat of the grade would be in the research project. Um, and I call it a research project because sometimes people would do a traditional paper and sometimes they would do something else. I taught uh, seminars in public history. So sometimes people would engage in, in oral history projects or memorial projects or commemorations, these types of things. Um, that 80 points, I'm sorry, it's, it's, I got the math wrong here. So participation should have been 20, 10 points, I apologize. Um, would be a, a proposal and an annotated bibliography, graded, right? Um, a draft, the first draft would be 25 points and that would be graded. Uh, students would give a final presentation, 10 points, it would be graded. And the final draft would be 35 points and graded. So again, everything's kind of high stakes here. And, and, and I think a traditional faculty member, a traditional scholar would go, yeah, I, I see some rigor here, right? Rigor equals, right, difficulty or rigor equals, moments of judgment, um, as it were, which, you know, may or may not be the case. Um, so, so here are my current MCAD courses, and this is where I've fallen after six years of teaching at MCAD um, and, and really renegotiating um, what I mean by stakes um, and, and changing what that means um, and redefining the stakes in order to increase engagement um, and increase student engagement. Um, and, and I'll show this in another way too in a moment so we can do some direct comparisons. Um, typically in my topical courses, so right now I'm teaching the history of rock and roll, which is a topical course. It's a 3000 level course, although that, that has very little meaning um, at MCAT in practice. Um, I assign right away um, the first four weeks of class each week, one of these is due after the first week, um, what I'm calling reading engagements. Um, they are five points each. There is no grade for these. They are graded excellent, pass or fail. Um, and it is really difficult um, to get a fail. Hand it in and you will get points, right? Um, I'll read the assignments for the first two, so you get a sense, right, of, of what I'm asking students to do. So, so this was the first reading engagement I asked students to um, hand in in my history of rock and roll class. And this, this was related to some, some articles that I had posted on Canvas, PDFs. Um, and so what I asked them to do is, uh, please answer the following question in no less than 200 words and no more than 250 words. Please try to be clear, coherent, logical, and reasonable. I will not be grading this assignment on both content and form. I will be grading it on content, right? Um, you may rewrite it for a better grade after I return it. No one does that because everyone gets a four or five points on this. It's by design. I don't tell them that, but it, it lowers anxiety. So this is the first question I asked. Is the blues a revolutionary involving or causing a complete or dramatic change or evolutionary relating to the gradual development or change of something art form, right? Um, if you do the readings and you sit down at your computer and you type 200 words, you should be able to do this, right? Um, and since I'm not grading on grammar, I'm not grading on style, I'm not grading on whether your thesis is even discernible, I just want a reaction. 
um, students very quickly learn that they can confidently hand something in to me before class starts, right? Um, the second one I asked to do, do the week following was identify and explain the most significant cultural challenges that 1950s rock and roll posed to mainstream American society. Again, there were readings, right, that they had, and they could quote them if they wanted to. They didn't have to. They could go off the cuff. Um, but this was graded, right? Excellent, five, pass, four, right? Um, fail, nobody failed it if they handed it in. Um, now, the function of this is to get them right away used to handing stuff in to me, right? Um, so the first weeks two, three, four, and five, they hand something in, very small, little bagatelle every week, and then I put comments on them. Sometimes I will point out that's, that's a lot of passive voice, and here's why that's not good. But usually it'll be questions, right? What do you think of this? Why don't you think of this? What, what about this, right? And so I will, I will write comments on these and pass them back. And so they're due just before class. They get the points. They come prepared in class to say something, right? Um, if I have a class of silent people, I'll go, okay, read to me your reading engagement, right? Or post it in the chat, right? And then we have something to talk about. Um, and so, so right away, they're comfortable with handing stuff in. They're comfortable that I'm not going to be tearing stuff apart, right? Um, they're getting points very rapidly um, and rewarding participation, right? And, and, and the idea is to get people to participate. Um, in addition, in this, this class, I, I've asked for two personal narratives. And I'll do that in my topical classes. They don't rely upon research. Um, it's about their experience with the subject in some way, shape, or form. Um, in the case of the history of rock and roll class, I post up playlists at the beginning of every class of, of songs, um, of YouTube videos that relate to that specific era or that specific genre. Uh, this past week we did disco, right? So I had six or seven um, disco songs. And so I asked them um, to tell me what they think of that playlist, right? This is their personal narrative. Did it work? Did you learn something from it? Does, why did I put those six or seven songs together? Do you have a counter playlist that you want to give me? Do, do you want to do a better job at it, right? And so, so this doesn't require so much expertise. It does require that they get invested in it, right? Um, and that I will also grade, excellent, pass, or fail, right? These are, if you do the assignment, you will get points, right? Um, I tend to be a little more involved in terms of style and form as I'm grading these because of where these come up. You know, I've got the first four reading assignments that are relatively easy that I, that I just have a conversation about. I tend to ratchet up my, my comments on style and grammar and that kind of thing, but it's still, it's not a deal breaker, right? I just add more of that in my, my comments. Um, the next thing I have is, is some kind of project in all my classes. Now I'm, I'm, I'm getting way into history of material culture. Um, so I'm trying to bring objects in my classes. And so in this class, they had a project reflection. Um, so we did a project together. In this case, we made cigar box guitars. So I could tell them something about the blues and material culture history and that kind of thing. And I just wanted them to reflect on it. What did you learn, right? Um, and that's another 400 to five, two page assignment. Um, it doesn't require expertise, right? Um, but it does require that they pay attention, that they reflect upon what they did, that they, they relate this to the subject matter um, and to historical scholarship. Uh, again, that one is graded essentially on, on effort, right? Did you engage in the assignment? After that, I tend to dial things up a little bit. There is a review essay, and that does involve sources, and it does involve citations, and it does involve a little bit of research, and it does involve close, long-form reading. And that's when I start grading things, right? That's when I start giving them a B or a C or an A, and I give them lots of feedback on style and content, um, which then leads us into the research project. But again, I've kind of reformulated the research project for these topical classes as well, so that the constituent elements, if you see the way I've broken it down here, are pass-fail. If you do this, if you meet this deadline and you tell me what your topic is on time, you get five points. If you give me your annotated bibliography, um, it should be five points. That should be a uh, um, sharp, sorry, it should be a parentheses, not a nine. Um, if you give me a rough draft, right, you'll get points. And then the final draft is 15 points, and that is graded, right? Um, and that is kind of very rigorously graded. And I read these things closely and give them lots of com comments. And then, of course, there's participation. Um, for the research seminar, I've done a similar thing, right? Um, I have, and this is the 
capstone liberal arts class at MCAD, the liberal arts advanced seminar. Um, again, I use kind of discussion engagements. I use that model and I, I have four of them right away that gets them used to handing stuff in that, that gets them, we build up some trust and we build up some, they understand how I'm going to speak and, and I get, I get to see where they're at as well. So, so for the research seminar, it's a little less, it's a little more directed, um, towards discovering, you know, the, the liberal arts method that they want to use for their project. So, so the first of the four reading, um, I'm sorry, discussion engagements in the liberal arts advanced seminar was we, we assigned uh, Nicholas Mirzoff across all of the sections um, piece called The Right to Look, which is posted on Canvas. Um, and I asked them to come to class having written down the following in a document you can share. Three observations about the reading, three questions about the reading, and three key quotations about the reading. If they do that, they get the points, and we have something to talk about, right? Um, the second one for this class is, please send me a document with the answers to the following three questions for class about one, the author's thesis, two, the author's argument, um, three, one substantive critique of the article. So it's a little more directive than my top of the class because it is a research seminar, but again, the idea is, you know, lowering the barriers to participation, kind of increasing the rewards for getting into the rhythm of the class and engaging. Um, in my liberal arts advanced seminar um, classes, I do what I call a group archive project because I teach the historical method, but they don't have to use that. And that's working with archives um, and primary sources. It's a group project, right? So I'm not going to grade them. Um, but I am going to, you know, I might dock points for late work. I might dock points for someone not participating. Um, and again, that's graded excellent pass or fail. The meat of this class, again, is the final research project. Um, and as I do in my topical classes at MCAD, now I've broken that down into lots of little pieces where there's a lot of reward for effort, right? Um, but the final draft, again, is going to be a graded moment, right? Um, I do not want people leaving my class with a false sense of what their abilities are. And so that's why I have these graded moments. You, you may get a B in the class, but you knew you got a C on that final draft because this, 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 and this, and this, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie to people about what they're doing in terms of the liberal arts method, but I'm not going to use that as, as a way of, of you know, punishing them or, or imposing some sense of what rigor might be. And, and obviously participation, right? Um, and that's just to get people to show up. So, so if you compare these things side by side, same thing, I've just reproduced them side by side, you can kind of see my evolution here in terms of what I'm asking for in these classes. Um, so on the left, you have for topical level classes, not the intro, but you know, two, three, 400 level classes, what I used to do, um, at a liberal arts college. And then what I do at MCAD now, one thing that you will notice is that the MCAD version seems a lot more labor intensive for the faculty member, because there are a lot more things you got to keep track of, um, in terms of deliverables. Um, that's kind of true and it's kind of not true. Um, in the previous rigorous high stakes model, tons and tons of time spent grading and doing line by line readings and justifying your evaluation and, and defending the fact that this person got a C and not a B or not an A. Um, so that's labor intensive in its own right. Um, in my more kind of low stakes, higher engagement model, um, you know, it's almost more fun for me to grade because I don't feel compelled to do the kinds of really exacting work that I do when I'm defending a high stakes grade. And, and it can, you know, begin some kind of interesting conversations, I think. Um, and then the research seminar, the liberal arts college model on the left and the MCAT model on the right. They're, they're beginning to get closer, right? in the number of bullet points I'm asking for um, due to the nature of the classes. Um, but, you know, the MCAT model seems like it's more, uh, labor intensive, but in, in many ways, you know, it's not um, as labor intensive. Um, I'm going to stop sharing because that's all the slides I have. Um, I'll pause for a moment if anyone has comments, questions, critiques of that. Um, Absolutely. And we're, since we're in a webinar form, just to remind folks, we've got the Q&A function that's available for us. Um, yeah. 
I'm, I, I have one or two questions, but I want to see if, if anybody else wants to enter anything here. So far, I'm not seeing anything. You hinted at Gerald talking about rigor and like mm -hmm. how, how your definition of that may have evolved over mm -hmm. time. I don't know if you want to go there yet or if mm -hmm. that's for later. Um, no, I'm, I'm happy to go there now. I mean, I, 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 if someone said that I'm, I'm, you know, involved now in destroying Western civilization um, with my classes, I'm, I'm, I, you know, depending on what the argument is, I might have to say guilty as charged, right? Um, because I, I'm not, in, in some ways this is, you know, it's a much easier class to pass that I teach at MCAD than where I taught before. Um, I would say it's, it's equally as difficult to get an A, however, um, at MCAT than it was at the place I taught before, but much, much easier to get C's and B's, right? And I'm, at this point, especially in the middle of the pandemic, I'm not even sure what rigor means um, because we're all kind of in this new environment. But, but what I know it doesn't mean, um, and I probably knew this, you know, it's not that I didn't know this when I taught at the other college before, are kind of artificial hurdles that someone has to get over and that once you've proven that you can do something distasteful well, I'll reward you, right? Um, and, and, and I think students, if they're interested in something, they will impose rigor upon themselves, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, especially at MCAD, you've really lost the game as a liberal arts faculty member if you make them disinterested in what you're doing right away. And so for sure in the first half of the class, I'm much more committed to getting them to see what I'm doing and what we're doing together as something worth doing and fun and interesting. And if I can succeed in doing that by midterm, then I can turn around and start requiring other types of performances from them in their written work or in their oral presentations. Um, so, I mean, rigor, you know, I, I, I graduated college in 1987 and I went to grad school in the late nineties. And, you know, it was very much like a, the USDA grading system. Um, you know, you, you are choice, you are extra good, whatever. I don't remember what the, how they grade me. Um, but, but that, that was a lot of it, right? It was a competition yeah. to see who can win. And then the, the faculty member was the arbiter of that and the judge of that competition. I just don't think that's going to fly anymore. I mean, I, I might, my first year writing class was designed in such a way that 50% of the people would fail it for the sole purpose of making them do it twice. Right. And, and I think we all left as better writers, but I'm pretty sure we all left afraid of writing um, and not necessarily interested in doing it. And that's maybe that's why there's a 10 year gap between graduating college and starting graduate school. Um, and, and, and I, and I, I see, especially MCAD students are, are, are really ingenious at imposing rigor upon themselves if they're interested in the product, right? If they're interested in what they're doing. Um, and so, so I'm really all about generating interest. Um, right. Rigor, it's a discussion we have, I don't even like the word anymore. Um, <laughs> you know, it, we have in, in the department, we have in our cabinet discussions, um, and I'm, you know, that, that's actually worth unpacking and having it. What does that mean in 2020 or 2021? Um, exactly. Yeah. Here, Gerald, I've got two comments from, from George. I'm going to read through these. Um, one is, I really appreciate how you've outlined the differences between the liberal arts and MCAD models. Really nice to see that explained. Thank you. Um, something that I find myself doing now that I'm invested in a similar pedagogical model is looking for, student, for the student in the work with the intent of catching them at a later date as they work through other projects using ideas from our shared class. This seems to be paying off, or at least for some. Do you do something like this or see other faculty doing something like this effectively? Or put differently, is there something about engagement at MCAD that really emphasizes the long game with students? You know, that's a, that's a great question, George. And I, and I don't know that I'm the right person to answer it. Um, 
because department chairs teach one class a semester um, and they're oftentimes not necessarily in any kind of a sequence. So, so I don't get to see, I usually get to see students once, although, you know, I, I mean, students find their favorites. And so I, I'm, I'm not, I, I will have occasionally students who will take two classes from me, not three, right? Because that's, if you're only teaching one a semester, they're done with their humanities and social sciences requirement by the time they've seen you twice um, or three times. Um, so I, I wish I could say that I see that. Um, and, and I think those few students that, that have taken me as a faculty member more than once, I can see who they are. And, I, and, it, and it's fun, right? And it's interesting, especially by the time you get to the liberal arts advanced seminar, if I've had them, for instance, I taught Native American art, a very historical version, not an art historical version of it. Um, if, if I can't find anywhere else to teach it, <laughs> I'll do it. Um, or some other class and I'll see someone in the liberal arts advanced seminar and that, that I do see that um, MCAT students do have such personalities. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And now I think I've lost track of your question actually, George. Um, so I think it's m mainly about playing the long game. And if you, if you do something similar in your classes to promote that long game, or if you've noticed other faculty members doing, taking similar mm -hmm. tactics. Well, you know, I, I do try to play the long game because what I want, um, and I do take, you know, I, it's kind of nerdy, but I, I do take the, the liberal arts mission statement seriously. And that is to, to, to create artists who make critiques of consequence, right? And, that, and that's not about consequence. It's about having an opinion that people pay attention to. Um, that, that when you open your mouth as an MCAT graduate, um, you know, people can't just, you know, ignore it because you're an art school student, right? Um, that you have enough sense about things to actually get to the heart of a matter and say something trenchant and meaningful about it. Um, and so that's kind of the long game that I, that I hope I'm playing. Now, I'm super arrogant about my discipline. I think history is, is absolutely the key to the universe, right? Um, and, and better than anything else, at figuring out, right, who we are, where we are, where we're headed, where we should have headed, where we didn't have, you know. Um, and so, so I'm also convinced that if you, if you embrace a historical outlook or a historical spec perspective, you are well equipped for a very long trip through life. Um, and, and, and hopefully a little more stoic um, as a result of it, you know. Um, you know, there's no reason to panic. Um, is, is you know one of the things I learned from history that sometimes there are um, I don't mean to be too too glib about it um, but I you know I do wish I could see students more often um, and maybe the way to do that is is you know how I can do it even though I don't teach them is go to exhibitions right um, go to their senior exhibition and ask them questions or or if I see some, some work on the wall ask them about that um, you know, um, and sometimes there's success, right? Um, sometimes you see impact. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I'm gonna just keep an eye uh, on the Q and A here. So far, we're we're all caught up. Um, I okay. was uh, go go ahead, Gerald. Do you, are no, you no, more? Go ahead and ask your question. No, I I, I do have some place to end up here, um, okay. but but I can get there eventually. So go ahead. Okay. Well, I th I caught on to one thing you mentioned while you were describing your approaches was um, the way you've broken it up into lower stakes activities. And then um, you mentioned creating rituals. And I wondered, like rituals of engagement. And I wondered how you, how did you come to that? Was it out of frustration because of the lack of engagement? Or how, what brought you to that idea of, of creating new rituals? I, that, that happened because of the late work or no work problem. Okay. Um, or, or getting all of it at the end of the semester. And I, and I was trying to figure out how to get people in the habit of giving me something and not worrying about it, right? It, even if you have to dash it off in the half hour before class starts, do it, right? Um, because that's going to make class more worthwhile than you showing up um, and, 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 and waiting, you know, somehow by osmosis, um, being able to engage in the, in the conversation. I, I've also drastically reduced the page count in readings. Um, you know, I, 
at, at, in another class I taught in the other college, um, it was an interdisciplinary class with a chemist, a philosopher, a religious studies person, and me, right? And all four of us were in the room. And, and the chemist assigned a biography of Newton. Um, and I became infatuated with the infinitesimal um, that, that you can expand even a 10 page reading out into an infinitude, right? Um, if one wanted to. And so, so along with having regular assignments that getting used to that, um, I also drastically reduce page counts. So, so for instance, the first class, there'll be 15, you know, I'll, I'll have one 15 page required reading that may not even be scholarly. It might just be, you know, some, some public intellectual who's writing about this issue um, so that people can actually feel like they can sit down and, and with a cup of coffee and maybe a refill, get through this and think about it, right? I'm thinking about a half hour, right, of their time, maybe an hour, depending on what their reading speed is, um, you know? And so it worked, I think, um, in, that, in that midterm now, I have far fewer people who are getting Ds and Fs because I have nothing on my grade book, right? Um, they have something there. Um, and that because they have something there, that's not just points. It means that for four weeks, they attended four classes and it wasn't just a blank slate, right? So for those four weeks, as superficially as they may have encountered that material, there was something there in that conversation. So they weren't just checked out, right? Or furiously transcribing everything because that's what they're gonna do instead of reading, right? right. Um, and, and, and so it was, that, was, that was the ritual. I'm, I'm, it, it was really you know, about getting some kind of efficiency out of the whole thing. Um, and there might be some more kind of transcendental benefits, but I didn't think of those. It was really a very kind of pragmatic approach that led me to that. No, it sounds fantastic. And it really aligns with, um, as I've been reading about during the pandemic, what are things we can do to help students that concept of creating rituals and creating bite-sized pieces really aligns with what it sounds like is working for a lot of people. So you know, and I wanted also to get them in the habit of of doing things steadily rather than in one big burst. Because MCAT students, I think more than any other students I've I've encountered as a group, or you know, I, I don't want to paint them all with the same wide brush. But it's really an all-nighter culture in ways that I have not seen. I mean, they're all it, every college is an all-nighter culture in some way, shape, or form. Um, but I think because they're artists and they rely on inspiration, not understanding that inspiration actually is the result of preparation, right, and more long-form kinds of ways of thinking about the world, um, think that they can do that in all their classes. Now, I would argue they can't do it in their studio classes either. They're just, they just don't see the work that went in up to that point of inspiration in quite the same way that they will see it in a liberal arts class, right? Um, because, you know, I, I'm thinking about some students in particular who took more than one class from me. They just draw all the time, right? Um, I was thinking of Ryan Warbleski, right? There was not a moment, and he took two classes from me. There's not a moment he wasn't drawing all the time in my class. And then, and then when he pulls an all-nighter, he may not have understood that there's, you know, years of preparation that went into that. So, so it's really about getting them to that, you know, trying to find some balance where they're going to do the same kind of thing. I force them to do it in liberal arts, and they don't know they're doing it, maybe in their studio work. But, um, but it ha I have been able to challenge that all-nighter kind of culture to a certain extent. Um, I see less of it, right? I see that what's great is, is I'm seeing more and more of these reading engagements, these low stakes assignments coming in, not the morning they're due, but the day before, right? So I teach Mondays now and I'm getting most of these things Sunday night. Um, when I first started doing it, I'd be getting most of them at 9.15, right? The day of class. Um, and that's, that's, probably true for the first assignment in this semester too, but, but they feel free to get it in earlier. Um, they don't wait till the last moment. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for answering that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not seeing any other okay. questions. Well, I mean, I'll go back to the list I started with um, of, okay. of the challenges, right? And, and I'll, and I'll give you some, some sense of, my rate of success, right, in meeting them. Um, you know, 
COVID. It's a disaster. I don't know that this is any better or worse you know, at meeting this problem because I, you know, I, I don't know how it's, to be perfectly honest, I'm at a loss um, for, for this, for how the students are experiencing this. And I don't, since this is new for all of us, I'm not sure how best to um, evaluate work this semester. Last spring was an emergency. So, you know, really light hand and grading. I feel ethically responsible for not doing that this semester. I feel like I need to, to intervene and, and, and make some judgments about the quality of work. Um, I don't know how it's gonna work out. We're only halfway, we're, we're a little more than halfway through, but, but we'll, we'll see. Um, I am having more satisfying discussions. And, and this goes back even to last year when we were face to face, um, when I really started lowering the stakes, lowering the page count really aggressively, just, just getting people inter in, interested in my discipline. Um, and, and I think I'm having more satisfying discussions because they don't feel like they're being graded all the time, right? Whereas before I would grade their readings and, and be really, um, you know, like, like a humanities oncologist. I'm going to tell you what's wrong, right? So you can fix it. Um, Cause that's what you're here for. Um, I think it, that they feel like there's less judgment. And so they're, they're, they feel free to speak. And because they feel free to speak, I think their insights are more interesting. Right. Um, and then I can tell them where they've really achieved some level of discernment or critique or engagement. Um, and they, they do it you know, more often, sometimes that accidentally, but they're speaking more, so it helps. There's still lots of students who don't speak at all. And, and I'm never, I, well, I'm gonna keep trying, right? Um, I'm not gonna give up, but I, I think that's just the reality, but it's better. Um, I'm seeing more participation and I'm seeing more joy in that participation. I'm seeing more interest. Um, there are, I'm still getting late work. Um, at a slightly lower rate, as I said, because people are getting things done slightly more on time. But what I'm not getting is no work. Um, three years ago, um, in a liberal arts advanced seminar, I might have hit midterm and, and had a bunch of zeros on the grade book. And I'm like, what the hell, right? And, and it becomes a crisis, right? Um, don't, I'm not really having that problem now um, because of this. So they have something. Um, there's, you know, I'm still getting poor work. Um, and, but I think it's not because they don't care. I think it's because I need to train them, right? Um, so I'm seeing more care. They're still, they're still 18, 19, 20, right? The, the kinds of soft skills that we try to teach in liberal arts, I, I think you're not gonna see them emerge till they're 25 or 26 or 27 in many cases. So I'm not worried about that, but, but, um, uh, but there is care. Right, it's not it's not poor because it's slapdash. It's poor because I'm beginning to see what they need now, realistically. Um, because they do care, I'm going to presume, and this may be an unsafe presumption, that the mistakes are real, and that those mistakes aren't the result of of inattentiveness. They're the result of ignorance, and that's fine, right? That that then I know what, where to put my efforts, and that to me is very helpful. Um, I'm seeing more curiosity. And I've taught now history of rock and roll twice, once four years ago, or five years ago, and once now. Um, and, uh, you know, how do you make rock and roll boring? Well, I can tell you how to do it based on the class I taught four or five years ago, which is very kind of method, a methods and theory class, which to me is interesting, but it's not to them. They want to tell me why they like this heavy metal band. They want to do... They want to do confession or, you know, they want to reveal themselves. They want to be appreciated for their taste whatsoever. And so there's room for that now. And there's room for that in the other classes I teach now as well, because I'm not focused on rigorously teaching them historical theory and methods, right? This is really, uh, they, they get it now. I, I kind of, I'm disguising the vegetables a little bit. It's there, um, but they're interested and they're curious now. And they feel, I think, more disinhibited about that because I have lowered the stakes, right? Um, and, and made space for that. I don't know if they can leave the class able to teach themselves yet. And that's really kind of, again, what I really want them to get out of my classes. And I'm, I'm not sure, but I think if they're interested in something, you can teach yourself that. And if, I, if they leave an interest in history, then I've kind of, you know, that's, I'll, I'll call that an achievement. Um, 
That's great. Do you, when you say teach themselves, are you thinking of any particular thing that you're looking for? Are there, are there like landmarks that you're aiming for that you'd love to see? Um, you know, in terms of, of my discipline, I want, you know, if they are less reactionary about something, right, mm -hmm. that they are interested in that, the, you know, current events, right, or, or, uh, you know, explanations, causal explanations of, of, you know, why we're doing what we're doing, you know, the, the response, for instance, maybe to uh, the uprising that emerges out of George Floyd um, or Black Lives Matter. What, what, what are they, what are the statements they're making um, about it? Are they parroting what they're reading on billboards or signs? Or are they, um, you know, investigating it themselves and are they able to use sources um you know that's what i hope to see but i you know i don't know if i'm going to see it um because i may not see them doing it right so. yeah absolutely no i think that's i think we're all thinking about that right now it's like how how do we make sure that time spent at private art school is is going to yield years of later learning as well mm -hmm. so yeah i wonder i'm going to prompt verbally one more time if anybody has any questions oh here's one from emily could you say more about how you have created group projects within this lower stakes higher engagement model specific examples or activities or prompts okay so so in the liberal arts advanced seminar um across all of the sections. We don't teach the same books. Um, we teach some of the same articles. Um, but, but each of those sections is required to use a nonfiction graphic novel. Um, not has, doesn't have to be the same one. So, so I did my dissertation work on the industrial workers of the world, and I have just box and box of primary sources. Um, so I, I just put together packages of primary sources that related to the chapters in the graphic novel I assigned. And then I assigned small groups to assess the graphic novel's ability or inability to create new knowledge using kind of visual epistemologies. And they were gonna assess that by looking at the primary sources. What do the primary sources say? What did the artist and the, the, the writer do with that information? And how did they present it in a graphic novel format? Um, and so I broke them into groups of four, gave them these packages of primary sources, and told them to tackle a few different questions. One, visual epistemology. One, you know, fidelity to sources. Um, and, and, and within that, those groups, there were, there were you know, note takers. There were the person who would do the presentation, the PowerPoint. There were the kind of script writer kind of thing. Um, and so I, I tasked I had them sort themselves out into those groups, um, and then they presented to their fellows, right, their peers. Um, you know, the the graphic novel version versus the really hardcore history archive version, right? And and the distance between those two, and and what we learned, and the goal was ultimately to 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 bring them to the point where they see, oh, I see the artist is in fact making. There's a thesis there. The art itself is making a historical argument. Is it grounded in the sources or is it not, right? Where's, where's the evidence for that? And, and it worked pretty well, actually. And I've done kind of similar projects because I like using primary sources um, in other classes so that people can kind of test, um, is it in the sources? And that's, that's, you know, that's the question that annoys all historians. If you're at a conference and someone says, yeah, it's an interesting argument, I just don't see it in the sources. I don't see it in the archives. You know, you're screwed, right? Um, because because you, you failed the historian's test um but but i tend to that's my go-to right mm -hmm. um at the very end too i set up panel sessions which worked out super well the last time i taught the liberal arts advanced seminar like like a conference um and had them all kind of critique each other's work and sort themselves out into to groups that made sense um and so the real grade was not on you know did you read it well um but you know How'd you guys pull it together and come out with a common theme? And, you know, did you sell it to me? And then, you know, again, they all passed. That, the, the goal was not to fail them, but, but, to, but to make them think about it. Um, and, you know, I think half the class, it was, it was an exercise. Um, 
but half the class really got into it, which was better than the first time I tried this, where one tenth of the class were into it, and the nine, you know, the other ninety percent thought, "Well, this, I'll go, I'll jump through this hoop because I have to." Absolutely, yeah. And I would think too that for that that particular group exercise of recreating a the sense of a conference, a panel, a set of panels, also furthers your goal of you know, can these folks teach themselves when they leave here because that mimics that well, action of knowledge. It also gives me the chance to model, right, mm -hmm. what a scholar will do. And, and as the kind of commenter in these panels, I took it super seriously. And I wrote 10 pages of text as I would if I were the commenter at a, at a conference um, and, and, and really tried to model what I thought would be the best example of what someone would do at a, at a, at a conference. And so, so without being too didactic, you know, you can just, you can strut your stuff and they can look at it and they go, oh, you know, that's what you can do. That's, that's the kind of things you can say if you use this method or this approach to this information. Um, and, and sounding and looking smart is a desirable thing to students, um, you know, as best I can. But, but that, you know, kind of incentivizes some of the work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, I, I'm wondering if anybody else has any other questions in our last, we've got like four minutes left. Last chance, last call folks. Anyone? Did, were there any other final points, Gerald, that you wanted to make sure you touched on? Probably, you know, <laughs> but I, I can't think of them now. I'm, I'm happy I used the whole hour. Um, totally did, yeah. Wonderful. And I, I am remembering one contextual element I wanted to shout out because there's some names in the in the list that I don't recognize. So they may or may not be familiar with um, MCAD. I think at one point, Gerald mentioned we've got 18, 19, 20 year olds. The demographics at MCAD are pretty traditional college aged folks. We don't have a lot of um, older students beyond the, that traditional age range. So that's where that reference is coming through. I mean, I think if I went back to a traditional liberal arts college, I would not revert um, mm -hmm. to the teacher I once was. Because I think students are different too. This was, you know, seven years ago. But, um, you know, what I, what I want, what I also am desperately trying to get away from is treating students as consumers. Um, and so that's not the goal either. Like lowering stakes is not because students will want it or because it's easier, because they're trying to buy degrees. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I want to avoid that very cynical place. And so I think this is a way of doing that um, by char and getting them engaged. Absolutely. Well, and I think a lot of the, the learning research is starting to back that up. And we're starting to see more and more people investigating how and where does the learning happen? What, what works best for the widest range of people? And I, these are some of the patterns that I'm seeing emerge, so. I mean, for those who are at, at, at this talk um, who are going to be teaching, I, I strongly encourage you to throw spaghetti at the wall um, and see if it works. You know, the, it, it, you know the, the lower the stakes for yourself, I think, as well um, as a teacher. And, and be perfectly okay with abandoning something if it's not working or, or going with something if it's working, even if you think it's a bit fluffy, right? Because um, you don't know. No, that's really great, great advice. Absolutely. All right, well, seeing no further questions, I'm gonna wrap this up and Gerald, thank you so much. This was oh, really sure. fantastic. My pleasure. Thanks. Excellent. Wonderful. All right, have a good evening, everyone. Good night, everyone.